I know a man in the Omaha area, and probably some of you know him as well. He's been a farmer for many years and really has been uh, the bishop's right-hand man there in Omaha almost since that mission was started uh, many decades ago. But he said something surprising, or at least when he started, his, his grandsons decided that they wanted to also be farmers. He told them something that sort of shocked them. And he said that, I'll help you. I'll teach you the ropes. Because he's, he's quite a successful farmer. He's done very well. But he told his grandsons, I will not help you if you work on Sundays. And unfortunately, his his grandsons are not traditional Catholics, so this to them was something fairly shocking. Because a farmer, no matter the day, has to do certain things. And if there are emergencies that come up, you have to attend to those emergencies. But this man, who is now in his late 80s, he said, I have never worked a Sunday or a holy day. And God has always protected me. And you can see this attitude in his life. He's just the most wonderful example of a Catholic man. And he can, he, he can give stories and examples that are really rather miraculous of times there will be a severe hailstorm or a tornado even that comes across the the countryside and you can almost see the property lines once the storm is over. The neighbor's crops decimated. His crops untouched. And this is uh, demonstrably true. The bishop will bear witness to these stories. But this gentleman took to heart what our Lord tells us in the gospel this morning. Seek first the kingdom of God and his justice and these things, everything else, your, your temporal cares shall be given you besides. This man really put the kingdom of God first. He still does. Again, in his late 80s, there is not a single day he is not at the holy sacrifice of the Mass. And he lives at least a half hour away from the church in Omaha. So a wonderful example and an inspiration to all of us that know him. Put first the kingdom of God. There's another example of this that I was privileged enough to experience myself, and, and I believe I've told this story before, so I for, uh, beg your pardon if it's a repeat. But the bishop has always been, of course, a wonderful example of resignation to God's will and, and relying on God's providence. When I was a seminarian there in Omaha, it was my duty as a novice to do the cooking. And the bishop also had me as the cook in charge of the shopping. But there was one day the bishop called me to his office and said, Brother, do we have plenty of food in the freezers? I said, oh, reasonably. He's like, okay, because... I don't think that we're going to be able to go shopping this month. So my natural instinct is to panic. What in the world? How? Okay. Um, sure. I, and the bishop just remained calm. He mentioned kind of in a, uh, you know, 
off the side sort of thing. I, I, well, Brother Xavier's looked into how much I can sell my Episcopal ring for, so we'll, we'll see if we need to do that. It's like, what? I, okay. Um, but, but I was absolutely flabbergasted by how calm the bishop remained. And I think he even said something to me. He's like, brother, don't worry. God will provide. So I went back, fairly nervous, to the kitchen and tried to assess how in the world I was going to get through the next month this way. And it wasn't, I think it was about two days later that the bishop called me to his office again. He's like, brother, do you have a few minutes? Like, um, yes, Your Excellency. It's like, okay. I would like you to uh, run to the bank just really quickly. I need you to deposit this check. Hands me a check. It's like, oh, you can look at it. Wow. And we, you know, no doubt about it, it was exactly the amount that was needed to pay the bills, to get by, and to, to get uh, back on our feet so that we could indeed go shopping. But it was amazing the bishop's resignation and trust in providence and how immediately it was taken care of. His trust was repaid. And, and this is just one little instance that, that uh, I was able to experience. I know that there are many more of these sort of stories that the bishop and the other priests can tell. But it's an important lesson. We have to have that perfect and that childlike faith if we are trying to do God's will he will indeed take care of us I'm sure that we all can at least to some degree remember when we were very young how there was this sense of absolute reliance on your parents Especially as, uh, like, we think of a toddler clings to their mother for fear of the unknown. If there's a stranger around, they don't want to have anything to do with a stranger. It's mom that they want. And I'm sure that we can remember that, that feeling at least somewhat. And this is the same trust that we need to have in our heavenly parents Christ rem reminds us in this gospel narrative, he is indeed our father. He knows our needs. But we also have a wonderful mother. I was thinking about that this month of September especially. We have three Beautiful feast of our Blessed Mother right in a row. The feast of her nativity on the 8th. The most holy name of Mary on the 12th. And our sorrowful mother on the 15th. And it, it just occurred to me, I'm sure that this has been written about, and maybe I, I don't remember where I read it, but uh, these three feasts seemed to line up beautifully with Words that we know very well and we pray every day. We talk about our Blessed Mother as our life, our sweetness, and our hope. The nativity our, of, of our Blessed Mother, our life. She's the beginning of our life in Christ. She's the dawn for Christ who is the perfect day. Our sweetness because in the spiritual realm, what could possibly be sweeter on our lips than the names of Jesus and Mary? And our hope. Because where in all of history should there have been less hope than at the foot of the cross... It was the darkest moment in all of human history, yet the moment of the greatest hope 
was the moment that we were redeemed as our blessed mother stood there beneath the cross. And so I was reminded very powerfully that yes, we have a mother who is our life, our sweetness, and our hope. And if we stay close to her, if we put our hand in hers, there is nothing that should frighten us. And so this is the the lesson that we should really take to heart today. We should remind ourselves of this, I think, very often. What comes around the corner next in our world is anybody's guess. It doesn't look very bright, we have to be honest. At least financially. Those of you that have financial cares, parents... It's rather frightening. Perhaps there will be a a time when we uh, really need to rely on God's providence. But we have to look back at the lesson in the gospel this morning. It's not just do whatever you want and trust and God will take care of you. That's a rather Protestant way of thinking. Sin and sin boldly, Martin Luther said. Trust and the merits of Christ all the more. This is false in every possible way. Yes, trust in Christ, but seek ye first the kingdom of God. So let us give God his due, which is first priority in our life. If we put him first, it'll be all right. St. Paul echoes the words of our Lord in his epistle to the Romans. He said, For those that love God, all things work together unto good. So my dear friends in Christ, let us do this, not just theoretically, let us not just say it in our minds, but do the will of God. Seek the kingdom of heaven, actively. And if we can tell ourselves honestly, yes, I am doing my best. I am I'm trying. There's always going to be rough spots. But genuinely, I, I, I can say to myself that I am trying. Then let us never fear. We will never be abandoned by our dear Savior. We will never be abandoned by our dear mother. Therefore, do not be anxious, Christ says. Seek first the kingdom of God and his justice, and all these things shall be given you besides. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, amen.